Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Daniel Moyer. I'm a sales support trainer here at Briggs & Stratton. And what we have for you today is a training on generator and energy storage integration, how they complement each other, how they uh, can uh, uh, compete with each other. We're going to look at some diagrams. We're going to look at some considerations on them. Uh, really also what we're going to do is even look at some portable generator considerations. A lot of people have portable generators, uh, and once they add an energy storage system, uh, how does that look like? Uh, with me today is Nathan Heston. Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are around the world. Um, looking forward to doing this training together with Daniel today. Yeah, thank you, Nathan. Thanks for joining us today, everybody. Um, one of the things to keep in mind is that this course is not NAPSEP accredited yet. Uh, we are going to uh, be submitting this one for NAPSEP and get uh, some, uh, get it approved so everybody can earn some continuing education credits uh, going forward. So stay tuned. Probably the next time we give this, we should have it approved. Uh, that's one of the housekeeping items. Other housekeeping items, that if you have any questions during the talk, go ahead and put them into the Q&A uh, uh, feature, the Q&A section. That's usually a button either at the top or the bottom of your screen. And Nathan will address some of the questions either by typing out the answers or uh, we'll stop and address some of the questions during the presentation or at the end of the presentation. So again, uh, we're talking about energy storage and generators today. Uh, we're going to look at uh, our company, who we are, uh, market, the outlook, the drivers, the growth. Uh, again, battery storage versus generators, how and why we combine them, portable generators, and finally, we'll look at some layouts at the end. One of the things I'm really excited about is Briggs & Stratton has purchased, purchased Simplify Power. So Briggs & Stratton is this 115-year-old you know, company uh, that's been known uh, to, gener to create power products, right? Engines, uh, engines in your lawnmower, engines and generators. Uh, in lots of different applications. So it's a well-known household name across America, maybe even across the world, I would argue. And that builds confidence. So when we're sitting down at the kitchen table with our homeowners or business owners, and we're proposing a, a package, we're proposing a solution, uh, they know that they can count on it. They recognize that name. Uh, we're not a company that's going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, and if you go to any of these uh, RE pluses coming up in next month or um, or in, in September, I should say, or any of these other recent uh, energy storage shows, uh, solar expos, you'll see a lot of people in the market. Everybody's coming to market with their own solution. A lot of these companies haven't had the history or um, the, the name brand recognition that uh, Briggs & Stratton has. So really what we can do is offer you one complete inter, uh, integrated energy solutions provider. Uh, what does that mean? It means that we make the generator and we make the energy storage system. So it's one tech support call, one warranty, one price list. Um, so you're able to really uh, combine these solutions together and make sure that they're going to work right out of the gate. Um, there's a lot of market drivers right now, and that's one of the reasons why you see so many people getting into the game. Uh, a lot of people want energy backup. They want storage. Uh, home is a haven. A lot of people are working from home now. This kind of came out of the pandemic. Um, you, we have a lot of people retiring. That means they really want to have that secure infrastructure at their house to keep the lights on, keep any medical devices on. Uh, we, we're not uh, necessarily approved for backup medical devices, but other certain things like CPAP machines. Really, people want to have the internet. Uh, communication is, is really important as well. We all know that existing infrastructure hasn't been kept up the way it should be. So what really the solution is going to be are these distributed assets that really provide uh, people the, the, the power. We're, we're giving people the power. Um, Climate-related disasters, I'm thinking about the heat wave going across the country now. Uh, the hurricane season is coming up upon us. Uh, these cause outages, and, and really to provide backup is going to be crucial. Now, whether that's a generator or an energy storage system, or perhaps both, we're going to look at that here shortly. Electrification of everything. A lot of uh, homes, especially here in California, are going uh, all electric. They're not running new gas lines to these homes. So we're seeing uh, the uh, heat pumps, heat pump water heaters, uh, electric stoves, electric ranges, uh, and a lot of thing electrification of everything. Really also the electrification of our vehicles uh, here in California. Again, we're, we're, there's 
plans and talk of phasing out gas powered vehicles. So what does that look like that you have, everybody has their own essentially refueling station at their home. And how do we capture that energy during the day when you're out driving your car at work, we could store it at the house or use net metering agreements to, to build your credit so that you can essentially stop going to the gas station and have a, a refueling station at your home. There's a lot of subsidies in, uh, available, even I would argue grants in your local area to promote and encourage people to adopt some of this new technology. The new I IRC um, tax credits now allow 30% tax credit on systems installed up into the early 2030s. And it should be noted that you're able to take a 30% tax credit on just an energy storage system minus a solar. It used to be that you would have to install solar and storage to be able to leverage that 30% tax credit. You don't have to do that now. You can put in just batteries. Uh, and of course, you know, understand that with the batteries, without some way to recharge them, the batteries are only going to last as long as they have juice in the, the battery. So having a generator, having solar recharge them definitely gives them more resilience, creates that microgrid, but you don't have to necessarily pair them. Uh, this, this market's growing. Uh, we really see a lot of people who have adopted solar already that now want to add batteries to their system. And we do have solutions with that. We can AC couple perhaps, or what we could do is maybe even remove that old string inverter, that old SMA or that old Fronius that's sitting on the side of the house. Perhaps the inverter is nearing the A end of its warrantied life, yet the panels up there on the roof are still chugging along. We can go ahead and DC couple in that existing solar into our energy storage system, into our inverter and start leveraging that DC coupled advantage. So exciting times, uh, we're all part of this solution. And uh, as I walk around my neighborhood, I realize that maybe there's only a handful of houses in our neighborhoods that have energy storage. What is it gonna look like in 10 or 20 years from now when all of us here in this call have been hard at work uh, installing distributed energy storage assets in our communities? What can an, uh, an energy storage system do? Well, obviously it can provide backup power. That's what a generator can do. What a generator can't do in an energy storage system can do is provide utility bill savings. A lot of people are now going on what are known as time of use rates, where during certain times of the day, energy is more expensive. Well, we can store power when it's cheap in our batteries and then discharge the batteries when power is expensive to help support those loads. So it's unlike a generator, which is kind of just sitting there waiting for an outage, an energy storage system is this grid interactive device uh, that can really help save money. It can really be kind of the solution to uh, a lot of um, uh, grid events. And, and that's kind of on the roadmap for a lot of people are demand response programs where you can let the utility essentially, or a third party on behalf of the utility, take control over your energy storage system and, and send commands remotely to your energy storage system so that it helps augment the grid or help support the grid. And you get paid financially compensated, not only for just being part of the program, but for usually for every unit or every kilowatt hour of electricity you send back to the grid. Off-grid has always been uh, where this industry really got started. I got started in this industry back in, 2000, industry back in 2007. I worked for a company called Sunfrost. We made these off-grid refrigerators. Uh, they could be on-grid as well, uh, but essentially that's where we got our start, back in the old uh, Arco solar panels or the Sharp solar panels or the ever you know Evergreen 175s using old Magna signs and old uh, Schneider or Xantrex equipment. So really off-grid is now kind of a small part of our market segment, but it's where we got our roots and it's still something that we support. Uh, we're one of the few energy storage solution providers that warranties our equipment for off-grid use. Uh, we're going to talk about this. That's why you're guys, everyone's here today is generator op, uh, optimization. What does that mean? Uh, we're going to talk about it here in a second. So let's quickly talk about, you know, the pros and cons of both generators and energy solutions. Why generators make sense and uh, understand that when you're sitting down at the kitchen table with the homeowner, uh, there may be a, a place and a time to pivot to one solution over the other. And as somebody who works for a company that makes both generators and energy storage systems, 
I don't necessarily care. What I care about is providing the correct solution to your customer that's going to give them what they're looking for. What are the pros about generators? Well, really, they have unlimited fuel. They can run as long as they, they you want, essentially. Uh, you know, a lot of homes have natural gas lines, city gas. That's an unlimited fuel supply. A lot of people have a thousand gallon propane tank sitting in the backyard or maybe the front yard if they have that. What does that mean? That you got a thousand gallons of propane sitting on your property. You can run that generator for a long time. Generators usually are set up to do a whole home backup. That's giving them all of their loads backed up. There's usually lower upfront costs, although I see that changing a little bit, especially if I need to you know, adjust gas lines and I got to do a lot of gas upgrades to your home. Uh, and once you start to account for uh, these subsidies, these 30% tax credits, you almost seen parity with energy storage and generators on upfront costs. We're not dependent on solar insulation. And what I be mean by that is that if you have a battery energy storage system and perhaps you live in a, a northern climate and you're using solar to recharge that battery, you may be in a part of the country where you're not getting a lot of um, solar insulation. And that's kind of what highlights this map behind me. What you're looking at this map behind me is a map of the United States showing the number of solar uh, sun hours for the worst month of the year. So essentially our December, January's. And you can see in some of those Northern climates that you don't get a lot of sun. So it's gonna be really important to have an oversized solar array or we start to manage the expectations of the homeowner. Nighttime cloudy operation. Well, that's a little different than solar insulation. That's just the daytime. You could be living in the sunny, you could be living in Arizona, but if it's cloudy out or it's, not, uh, it's nighttime, there's still not gonna be any sun to recharge those batteries. Cons of generators. So there has been historically always a danger with these generators. And I do see that city inspectors, city permitting inspectors are getting better at this, but there is a, a carbon monoxide poisoning uh, um, potential on these. And, and there were some tragic events in some of more recent outages, I believe in Texas, where there were some uh, people who died from carbon monoxide or at least got sick. Fuel costs, and that's gonna, we're gonna talk about this is that although generators have a lower upfront cost, if you start to look at the, the life of the system over 10 or 20 years, and you're not having to pay for costs, that's a, a, a con. Maintenance costs, um, you do have to ideally have somebody come out every certain number of hours or every year to change the oil in the generator, change the air filter, do maybe change the spark plug, change the starting battery. You can be limited by where you can install these generators. You know, I just mentioned carbon monoxide poisoning potential. So what do we want to do? We want to put the generator at least a certain number of feet away from any opening in the house, whether that be a dryer vent, a window, a soffit vent. So you're kind of limited. And a lot of AHJs uh, and, and certain um, uh, uh, homeowners associations are now limiting where you can place these generators. You may not even be able to install one at all in certain neighborhoods. They're noisy, they have fumes. And like I mentioned before, I got to get my uh, gas lines. I got to go get the... Um, the the um, the black iron out there and thread some gas lines. It it definitely takes an extra work and potentially causes some hazards. What are the advantages of energy storage? Well, they're eco friendly. That doesn't necessarily matter for everybody, um, but it does matter to some people. And being part of the problem, or, or not being part of the problem, but being part of the solution does matter. They're potentially safer. The reason I say potentially is that they're these are essentially home batteries that have very concentrated amount of energy in them. And certain chemistries like cobalt chemistries with these lithium ion batteries and, and potentially some form factors uh, can and have gone into what's known as thermal runaway. Fortunately with Briggs and Stratton uh, Simplify Power, we leverage a safer chemistry, lithium iron phosphate in a safer form factor cylindrical cells. And I do see a lot of people moving towards that direction. That's not to say that cobalt-based lithium-ion batteries do have a time and a place. I mean, of course, in more mobile applications where weight and size matters, like in uh, our power tools in our yard or perhaps our cars, uh, cobalt chemistries can be better. But when we're talking stationary storage, 
that's just sitting there in your garage or on the side of your home, I don't necessarily care about energy density. What I care about is safety. Uh, we can save money on electrical bills. I mentioned that earlier. They're eligible for that 30% tax credit. One thing that a lot of people don't kind of realize is the transfer time. So with the generator, and we're going to talk about transfer switches here in a second, there's that kind of make before or break before make where uh, boom, the power goes down in your house. You hear the generator start, da, 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 generator starts, and then you get the power comes back on. Well, what does that mean? That means your router has just reset. All the clocks in the house have reset. With an energy storage system, there's an eight millisecond transfer time. So it transfers so quickly that a lot of times you don't even notice. Uh, a lot of times you, you won't even notice until you look out your front door and see the neighbors across the street, uh, their lights are out. Uh, it's silent, which is definitely an advantage. So what are the disadvantages of energy storage? Well, they're definitely pricier up front. Uh, a lot of times I'm going to encourage everybody just to run critical load backup panels. I don't like to see the whole home backed up unless we can leverage some load shedding capabilities because the second you don't even notice the power has gone out and maybe you don't have your app in front of you so you don't see that you've gone into an off-grid mode or a, a grid down mode, I should say. Um, so it's, it's kind of essential that people understand what can be backed up. The potentially more complex warranty, what I mean by that is a lot of energy storage systems uh, might say that you only have a certain number of cycles with your batteries, or only a certain number of megawatt hour throughputs on the batteries, or a certain number of uh, years, and, and whichever one comes first, your warranty is now uh, uh, expired. Well, with here at Briggs & Stratton, what we like to do is keep it simple. Uh, we offer a 10-year warranty, unlimited cycles at a 100% depth of discharge, excuse me. Uh, what are the disadvantages? Nobody likes getting into your main panel and have, and I tell the guys, all right, you're going to have to pull, you know, homeowner, you cho choose six breakers, mark them with a piece of tape that you want. And I got to send the, the, the crew out there to now pull those loads out of that main panel and relocate loads. Nobody likes relocating uh, breakers to a different panel. So it's a little more electrical work. And again, we're gonna talk about this. There's limited power, right? Power being the ability to provide a certain number of watts at any given moment to say start a, um, a well pump or start usually in large inductive loads. There's, that's kind of more limited with an energy storage system and also limited with energy storage, uh, the amount of kilowatt hours, the, the fuel in the tank. And that's kind of what brings me to this is a lot of times when we're thinking about generators, when we're thinking about uh, energy storage systems, think of the batteries essentially as the fuel tank. How big is the fuel tank? And a lot, of, like I mentioned before, a lot of, um, you got a thousand gallon propane tank. So really you have this unlimited energy source. That's not true with batteries. There, there's a finite amount. Unless you have a way to put energy back in these batteries with solar or running a generator, um, you're, not, you're gonna run out of juice. And so think about power is kind of the engine of the generator, right? So the engine of the generator uh, may be uh, a 20 kilowatt or a 26 kilowatt or a 12 kilowatt generator. That's the kind of the engine. And you can think of the simplify inverter as a six kilowatt continuous inverter. And that may not sound like a lot, but when you start to really dial in your loads and look at what you really want to back up during one of these outages, uh, that is sufficient to run what you need your fridge, your lights, your uh, the blower motor in the, the heater and, and really give people the essentials. Now, of course, I'm gonna start to hear people with this heat wave, what about my ACs? What about my, my four ton air conditioner out there? Unless we start to scale these energy storage systems up, that may be the time and place to pivot and start talking about generators and how to, to do those. Uh, Nathan, before I continue, any good questions uh, come up or, or should I just keep going? I think I'm being able to answer most of them. One of the users asked if we can recommend any um, non-ICE generators. And I think what he was referring to is potentially wind or micro hydro. Um, but I'm going to wait for clarification there. Others have been asking about uh, where our products are available. I'm going to point them to our maps. Um, so let's just go ahead and keep going. I'll try to answer them and I'll, I'll stop you if there's some, if there's ones that, uh, that need to be brought to your attention. Great. Thanks, Thank Daniel. You. Yeah. Thank you, Nathan. 
So what we're seeing on the left is kind of what a typical generator setup looks like, right? We have grid, we have our meter can and this meter socket, right? And we're feeding into a, a whole home transfer switch. And that transfer switch is essentially going to allow grid power to flow through its, that, that transfer switch directly to home loads, which you see that load center on the left there, and just let it flow through. Simple as that. When the grid goes down, the generator is going to start up, get itself going, and then that transfer switch is going to switch, and it's going to start providing power to the home's load through the generator. So there's this kind of separate device. Now, that, that's the transfer switch. Now, it's important to note in a lot of energy storage systems, including ours, we have the transfer switch. It's really called a, uh, a micro interconnection grid device. I might have gotten that, that terminology wrong. But really what it is is the transfer switch is built into the inverter itself. So what we have is grid going into our meter can, meter socket. And a lot of people on the West Coast, uh, they may have meter mains, which is the same idea. Uh, you could really just lug off if you had to. Uh, but what we have there is non-backed up loads. We feed the energy we, right back into that inverter. And then what we have up top is our critical loads backed up panel. Down below, we have our batteries. What I'm not showing here is solar that could potentially be leveraged. So in a grid down situation, the inverter is going to disconnect itself from all of the, the non-backed up loads panel and that meter can and start providing power up to the loads up top. Really quickly, we're going to run through products and then start to get in some more of these considerations. Uh, we have been making these batteries in California for over 12 years now. Uh, our, where we got our started was with our Phi and Amplify batteries that you see down there on the bottom left. Those either do or do not have closed loop communications that can talk to other pieces of equipment. Uh, we can take these batteries and put them into cabinets. We have a Boss cabinet. Uh, six batteries can fit in that. We also have a Boss 12 that can fit 12 batteries. Uh, further, and I'll show you a picture of what that access cabinet looks like on the, <clears throat> on the inside, but we put an inverter up top, uh, either a Solark or our inverter, and down below we have six batteries. What I'm really excited to mention is that we do have our own inverter out now. It's the 6K Simplify Inverter. Uh, we have a battery that now can be outdoor rated and hung on a wall. So we don't have to leverage any of those battery cabinets that I showed you before. What also really makes this system really powerful is an energy track app, right? It's not like the good old Sunfrost off-grid days where people had to go out to the power shack and look at the face of the inverter to see what the voltage of the battery is. You can still do that with our inverter. And that's why I'm glad that the engineers still did include in a screen on our inverter for whatever reason. If your phone batteries die, you can still go out there. But this app is, is very powerful. And it really is how users, being both the homeowners and the installers, interact with the uh, system. That's how they monitor the battery level. That's how they do rote remote reconfiguration. That's how you as the installers are monitoring your homeowner systems. And this app essentially using the cloud can then, and a gateway, which is a little kind of uh, electronical communication device, can then send commands to reprogram that inverter the way we want it to be set up. So really powerful. Uh, we are gonna be having some new upcoming trainings that where we spend the whole hour just talking about why these apps are important, why the interface matters, and how specifically our app works. So stay tuned for that. Again, these are used to commission the system quickly, a fleet management. Uh, we can remotely reconfigure the system. So say you're in the van, you're in the truck halfway back to the shop, and you realize you didn't set something up correctly. Doesn't matter. You don't have to turn around. You can get into Mark's house right here. That's an example. Reconfigure it. Uh, it allows us to send updates. So a lot of times our systems have hardware built in to leverage new features and all we're waiting for are uh, software updates. So again, the, the battery lineup here is our Phi battery, which is a non-communicating battery. This has been a workhorse for us for years. Uh, and typically these batteries are used in systems that don't have uh, pieces of equipment that can leverage closed loop communication systems. So if you have the old Outback inverter, the old MagnaSign, 
perhaps some old Xantrex equipment or whatever the case may be, a Schne old Schneider stuff, uh, use the five batteries. Not that it's any uh, less capable of a battery. Uh, it's just that don't buy a communicating battery like you see in the middle if you don't have a piece of equipment that can listen or speak to it. If you do have something like a Solar, which we've had a great partnership with, or our new inverter, get the amplified battery. The amplified battery can transmit its state of charge, transmit its temperature, transmit commands up to an inverter uh, that can listen to it and, and really leverage those, those closed loop communication capabilities. The simplified battery on the far right also has that closed loop communication capabilities um, and it can, it can leverage that. All of these batteries do have battery management systems built into them. That's something that sets us apart. All lithium ion batteries have battery management systems in them, mainly there for cell balancing, but there's a lot of other protective features and analytical features that can be leveraged with these systems. There's the BOSS cabinets. You can really leverage these systems up. They do carry some of these UL certifications that are required for a lot of jurisdictions to allow you to pull a permit to install it. And that kind of goes back to my talk about safety. Uh, these UL 9540A and 9540 listings really kind of are able to demonstrate how safe or potentially how dangerous energy storage systems can be. And that gives insight into the stakeholders who care about safety like the homeowners, like first responders, like firefighters who are gonna to have to show up to some of these systems and then realize that these batteries are in metal cabinets inside a metal cabinet and, and maybe really hard to get to at some of these uh, chemistries that have a potential to go into thermal runaway like uh, cobalt based chemistries. Uh, these are outdoor rated cabinets. Uh, this is one of the great, I really like this for a lot of installers. Uh, this has an inverter mounted up top Batteries down below, there's terminal blocks that are already in there. So you can use bus bars and terminal blocks and really wire this system up, kind of, uh, kind of set and go. Uh, and then just run a couple conduits out the side and run it out to your critical loads panel, run one in from grid and perhaps another conduit out to the generator. High voltage solutions has been definitely very exciting. Last uh, show we went to, a solar Expo, a lot of people were very interested in high voltage solutions. Why? I think a lot of uh, the Solar 30K is one reason why, right? If you look at the Solar 30K or Solar 60K, we're starting to see larger commercial inverters that can support three phase 208, 480 applications. And if you look carefully at some of those Solar spec sheets, they're not they don't want you to feed in 48 volt nominal batteries like, like we offer with some of these others. They want high voltage, like 150 volts DC on the battery side. So what do we need to do? We need to run batteries in series rather than in parallel. And that's exactly what you're looking at here. Uh, you're looking at are these rack mounted batteries. Each one of those uh, on the left there is 4.3 kilowatt hours at 48 or 24 volts. And then we wire them in series. In this example, the battery management system is up top. It's on the, it's a kind of stack controller. It might be on a lot of people's minds for the heat right now, but it is a challenge when it gets cold. Uh, any lithium ion chemistry doesn't do well when it gets really cold. You can permanently damage your batteries. So we do have an environmental consideration uh, uh, talk webinar that we give and that one is NAPSEP accredited, where we spend the whole hour just talking about temperature considerations. That's not today. So I just wanna kind of quickly mention it though, that there is heating solutions. Uh, there's considerations about what is ambient temperature and what the temperature inside a battery or a battery cabinet may be. They're not the same, right? Cause we have internal resistance in the battery that's creating heat. We have inverters and charge controllers that may be creating heat. So it's important to understand there are temperature limitations on these batteries. Uh, and if you're dealing with really hot or really cold, uh, reach out to us. We'll, we'll happy to do some consulting with you or uh, stay tuned for some of those upcoming webinars as well. One of the really exciting things uh, that we've just started to announce is that we now have a 15 year warranty specifically on our communicating batteries, which if you remember is the amplify and the simplify batteries. 15 year warranty, unlimited cycles, unlimited throughput at 100% depth of discharge. It's not 
whatever comes first, like I mentioned before. And at the end of that 15 years, we warranty 70% of the retained capacity of that battery should still be left. Uh, the Phi battery, which is our non-communicated battery, still has a 10-year warranty. And at the end of 10 years, we're looking at an 80% retained capacity. So we're, like I mentioned, one of the few companies that's actually been around at just as long as our warrantied uh, batteries have. So we have batteries out there outliving their warranty to this day. I already mentioned this, so I'm, I don't want to go too deep into this. I want to get into the, the meat of it, which is generators, but chemistry matters, form factor matters. And as next time you go to a big, you go to RE Plus in Vegas, uh, start to notice, start to look at a lot of people's spec sheets. And a lot of people are moving towards uh, LFP chemistry. In fact, I even heard that, and Nathan has mentioned this before, that there's um, even the Tesla cars are now moving towards this safer chemistry. Not only is this chemistry safer, but it's also, I would, it's not totally environmentally benign, but it can be a little bit safer to mine. It definitely has less uh, so societal impacts in the mining of some of these uh, uh, compared to some of the cobalt-based chemistries. And really also what matters is that cylindrical cell. Think of a uh, double A or, or triple A batteries that are all packed inside these systems. Those cylindrical cells can contain thermal runaway events uh, better than say a pouch cell or better than say a prismatic cell can. The ability to charge our batteries quickly and discharge the batteries quickly matters. Why does it matter? Well, one, it allows you to start uh, and keep high power loads going, like say a well pump or um, other motors. But what it also matters is us ability to charge the battery quickly. And we're gonna get into this in a second because imagine we have an energy storage system Perhaps the solar is there, perhaps the solar is not there, perhaps it's cloudy out and the batteries are starting to be drained. Homeowners getting worried. Well, we can start up a generator, run a generator at full tilt, charge up those batteries quickly, perhaps in two hours, right? C over two means uh, the capacity of the battery divided by two is the number of hours it takes to, to charge that battery. So we could charge the battery up in two hours shut the generator off, save fuel, save maintenance, save runtime, save noise, fumes, and then just coast on our batteries until that rinse and repeat cycle happens. Hey, Daniel, we've got some great questions that have come in. Um, one of them was uh, related to what you're showing on the screen now about how many batteries can be, be run in parallel. No, sorry, the next slide. Okay, yeah. Um, and uh, this, this is an example with our Phi batteries where we have a very large number of Phi batteries paralleled here. I believe this is at an airport hangar in Hawaii. The question was, how many batteries can you run in, in parallel? And maybe you could break that down into the different types. Yeah, so really with the Phi batteries, there's kind of an unlimited amount of batteries that you can run in uh, parallel. These are the five batteries here. You can see that these bus bars are, are just all connected. So what we're doing here is we're kind of just connecting these batteries on the electrical side, right? The DC negative and positive. Now, when we start to talk about the amplify or the simplify battery, we are limited on the, the communication side of things. Uh, and I believe it's 72 batteries that we can run up to. Uh, 16, 16, oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Daniel, we have another question that came in, and I've um, I, I, it disappeared from my screen because I said we would answer it live. But essentially, it was this question: um, When pairing a generator for whole home backup um, with the Simplify unit and batteries, its potential in in the location that this um, uh, attendee is in that that um, there wouldn't be enough power coming from a single inverter to power the homes. And it's potentially that the batteries couldn't keep up. Is it possible to use Symphony 2 switches together with these units um, where you have load control? And additionally, is it possible, um, how quickly can these battery char batteries charge? Um, could they keep up with the home? Can we, can we power a, um, the home and bypass the inverter uh, while charging the batteries and supplying loads to the home. So it was a huge question, um, but I know you're going to get to it later on. And so I wanted you to comment on it and just have that in mind when you get to the slides where you're show, showing whole home backup. Yeah, thank you, Nathan. I, I'll just come a few of them right now. For the load shedding, we're not there yet. 
Uh, it's definitely something on the roadmap. And that's what's really cool about being able to push some of these firmware updates remotely, that the feature will be there uh, if the hardware is there. It's just going to be released. Um, absolutely, we can charge these batteries in two hours. And absolutely, we can use a generator uh, on certain systems to, to augment loads and, and help support the systems. OK, one more quick question for you. Um, I did get clarification from Horg. Um, uh, he says non-ice is a kind of a solid oxide uh, fuel cell generator. So I don't know that we have recommendations for um, fuel cell type uh, generators. Um, Daniel, you could comment on that a little bit um, you know, as no. to whether we do. Yeah, um, I, haven't, I haven't seen those really become mainstream yet. Right. Um, so we don't have recommendations yet for you. Uh, and I, you know, it's, a good, it's a good question. We'll look into it. Yeah, thank you, Nathan. Um, and I do want to mention, um, you know, that the generators here on your screen um, are definitely an option, right? We need, I mentioned it earlier on the topic. I'm not saying that uh, one is better than the other. I'm saying, you know, listen to your customers' needs and sell them, present to them the solution that's going to best fit their needs and their desires. Uh, and here we are on our screen as a Power Protect 12. Uh, it's one of the, it's a stand up kind of vertical generator. So it has a very small footprint, Power Protect 20 and a 26K on the far right. At the heart of all these generators is the engine. Uh, and we have this Vanguard engine. Uh, you can see some of the benefits here. It's an it's engine that's not only used in generators, but also uh, lawn equipment. My uh, mother in law's. Husqvarna lawn, riding lawnmower has this engine, and it's really meant to be used in a repeated start and stop cycles. So when you have it leveraged in a generator, it's kind of just sitting there. It's a great uh, heart of the engine. Don't want to go too deep in, into generators, but just know that they're there. Um, they're, they're all the way from Power Protect 10 to, to the 26. For people looking to leverage a generator with an energy storage system, I would recommend starting at the Power Protect 12. That's the smallest generator we make that leverages our GC1031 controller, which has this two wire start capability. So we can send that. And we're going to talk about what two wire start means here in a second. Um, but it also has a, uh, an electronically governed engine. So it has a pretty clean sine wave. Uh, and we're going to talk about how big a generator should go. That at some point, you don't want to go too big of a generator because you're never going to really be able to leverage all of that generator's capabilities if you're running it through an inverter. And I'll talk about what that means here in a second. We do make non-emergency air-cooled generators. And I should mention all of these generators are gaseous fuel. That means they're propane or they're natural gas. They're not diesel. They're not gasoline. Uh, if, that, if that's something you want, we're going to talk about portables here in a second. What the non-emergency power protect line is, is a generator that's warranted for non-standby use, right? A lot of generators that are sold have, including our own, are have warranties for not for standby, which means they're designed to be put into a home that has grid that's only really going to be called upon to run when the grid goes down. Non-emergency certification means that it can be leveraged in an off-grid home and it doesn't void your warranty. And, and the warranties definitely matter. What I see, everybody kind of warranties for the parts, for the for the, the major components. Where people sometimes lack is they're not going to compensate you for sending a crew 30 miles down the road to, to, warrant, to do a warranty fix. Uh, it costs money for the, the van registration, the tires, the, the travel time. So we do warranty for mileage and also the labor because you're paying these people uh, to, to do this work and you need to be compensated. Transfer switches, uh, our standard transfer switch is controlled by the generator. What I mean by that is you, you're, the grid's running feeding to the home, passing right through this in, uh, transfer switch. Grid goes down. The generator senses that grid's gone down. It starts itself up. It warms itself up and then sends a signal to transfer to the transfer switch, which is what you see here. And then the transfer switch transfers and then allows the generator to start feeding loads. That's a little different than our Symphony 2 switches. In this example, it is the generator and the transfer switch are both looking for grid. So we're normal grid mode. Grid is flowing right through this transfer switch, right to loads. Grid goes away. The generator sees that. It starts itself up. The transfer switch sees that grid's gone down. 
but it's not going to transfer until it sees that the generator has come up and is providing and it proves that uh, the power from the generator, and then it's going to transfer. And somebody has already been ahead of me, but there is Symphony 2 power management systems uh, that you know can be leveraged and, and give us a call. We can talk through a little bit about this. Uh, you know, native to the system, load control is not there, but absolutely it's there for generator systems. Uh, when we start to integrate the energy storage system, it can be done, but call us and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So the first example I, I mentioned was the signal to transfer. The generator is monitoring the utility and tells the transfer switch when to transfer. The second one, the Symphony 2 is auto mains failure, where both the generator and the automatic transfer switch are monitoring utility and then base their decisions on that. What we're about to talk about here in a second is a little bit different. It's two-wire start, where the automatic transfer switch, which is essentially the inverter in our example, or, or an automatic generator start, is sending a two-wire signal to start to start that generator. Liquid cool generators definitely are made by Briggs & Stratton. These are much larger systems. And so if that's something you're interested in, just like those high voltage batteries, uh, reach out to us. I'm not the expert in these, but we do have a team that knows about that. Why should we pair a generator in energy storage? Well, it's kind of a relatively new idea for grid tide. It was either kind of an, or this or that. But now that we have one company, Briggs & Stratton, providing the energy storage system plus the generator, you can now integrate these systems more seamlessly and with better support, better warranty. I used to have to go out and get the, you know, the Outback inverter, the uh, Victron battery controller, uh, somebody else's batteries, somebody else's generator, and, and kind of cobble it all together. That's, that's kind of a thing of the past. Uh, you can now leverage these systems together in one company. Really, what energy combining energy storage system and generators to, together gives your homeowners more resilience. If you had the generator or energy storage separate, right? The, the energy generator is, is having to run, chug along. You may be limited on fuel. Energy storage is definitely uh, dependent upon uh, solar insulation and whether it's nighttime or, or cloudy out. What we can do is use a generator during bad weather to start up the generator, charge up that battery, and then shut the generator off. Keep in mind that these systems can be purchased separately. Why don't we, for example, we could just come out to the home and install our inverter, no batteries, no generator, just get a grid tied solar and tell the homeowner we can be battery ready. We can come back and add the batteries. Uh, we could potentially just sell them the generator with the idea of adding energy storage at the um, future. So it's important to understand that fuel can be hard or impossible to get in a crisis. So it's, it's a lot of times city gas, you think of it as unlimited fuel. Uh, but, you know, when we start to really talk to kind of the prepper community out there, maybe uh, they're the idea that you can uh, utilize a generator to save fuel does matter. A lot of these standby generators, when they're powering your home in a grid down situation, aren't running at full tilt, right? They're, you got some lights on, you got the fridge running. Uh, there might be running at a very low load rate, which isn't necessarily the most fuel efficient. So what we can do is we can load up those generators, not all the way, I don't want to pedal to the metal on the generator, but maybe get it up to about 70% loads. That's the most fuel efficient point. Then we run that generator as hard as we can to charge up the generators and then shut the, the, the generator off. While we're running the generator, we can support loads and charge the batteries. Another example, and this can make a difference if depending upon the architecture that we're trying to do, and there's lots of different ways to do this. And a lot of people have you know, great ideas and, and concepts and ideas. And we're happy to chat about how these systems can be integrated. Um, generators can be kind of separate. So it's kind of an either or situation. So imagine batteries are starting to get drained. It's cloudy out. What we can do is kind of disconnect the energy storage from all the loads and use a generator to support loads, not using the generator to necessarily charge the batteries, but in a, in a way, give the energy storage system a rest to allow the batteries to be recharged in solar and then swap back. So Daniel, yes. uh, 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 Diane asks for clarification. Do you need to have a transfer switch in addition to what is in the inverter? No, you do not. 
essentially one of the inverters, and this is kind of goes back to the old grid tied solar days, the inverter has to have what's known anti islanding where in a normal situation, if say the, the grid goes down and you have solar, the last thing you want to be is the person on the block that's back feeding solar onto the utility grid and you electrocute the, the electrician linemen down the road. So what all inverters uh, have is the ability to sense grid and will disconnect itself from grid if it senses uh, the loss of um, utility. And that's actually not, not very well understood by a lot of homeowners that have solar only. They think for some reason that their, their solar only is going to be able to, to keep the lights on. A lot of the grid tied inverters like your SMAs um, and, and the, the Fronius's and stuff like, they're, they're going to shut down. They're essentially going to send rapid shutdown signals uh, to shut down solar and only turn themselves back on when grid comes on. What our islanding inverters, what our hybrid inverters do is essentially disconnect it from grid, use batteries to create the home's microgrid. So any other devices like AC coupled solar don't even really see that grids disappeared and they still see a, a nice clean sine wave and they'll continue doing their thing. Nathan, did you have anything to add? Uh, no, I think that is a good answer, um, Diane. So Daniel's going to show some configurations in a little bit, um, which talk about sizing. And so if you, you there's the potential to use a transfer switch if you're trying yes. to bring in large amounts of power, um, but the inverter can pass through some of that generator power to loads. We have a 40 amp um, uh, breaker um, that brings in generator power per inverter. So if we wanted to do more power than 40 amps, 240 volts, um, we would need to parallel inverters or potentially use a transfer switch to isolate the generator and inverter um, from each other. Uh, but Daniel's going to get into configurations and hopefully if you want more details, uh, he'll, he'll answer those questions. We got another question, Daniel comes in, what non-combustion en engine generator would you recommend? Um, so here he's asking for an engine non-combustion generator. So I'm not sure I understand that, but I do, I, after Chris's clarification, it seems like when we're talking about non-ice um, engines, we're, we're talking about uh, really fuel cells. Um, and that's, that's related to the state of California. So we don't have good recommendations for those. I don't have a good recommendation for a non-combustion engine generator. I'm not sure what that would be. Um, Daniel, do, do you? No, and I'm kind of thinking about, you know, when solar was expensive, a lot of other people would think about micro hydro, not, you know, up in the hills where a lot of off-grid people live, there's a lot of water, a lot of elevation, which allows you to kind of leverage these micro hydro systems. Um, but with solar being so cheap, why not just add a few extra panels? So, and then another one is wind. Uh, a lot of times wind uh, generation um, it worked and, and it was great when solar was really expensive, but they wind has a lot of moving parts. What happens when the batteries are full and you have to start using uh, dump loads to get rid of that so you don't, you know, free, free spin your, um, your wind turbine. So, you know, when we say generators, uh, I think of anything that can then provide power. Um, but yeah, if, if fuel cells, if somebody has done a fuel cell uh, system, uh, I'd love to see a picture of it. Um, and and let's I'd love to see see how that would go. Keep in mind that you know a fuel cell still requires hydrogen, and so the hydrogen still has to be pr you know uh, produced from fracking water. I don't know if I got that right, Nathan. You're uh, you're the physicist in the group. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you can produce hydrogen fuel. I think we should probably stop there with a the fuel yeah. cell. Um, you know, I, it's been 20 years since I've actually even used a fuel cell, and I'm sure the technology is greatly improved. But yes, you need a fuel source. It doesn't necessarily have to be hydrogen, although that's the most popular. Uh, let's move on. Drew did want to remind you that SMA has their sunny day outlet, which provides 1500 watts, even when there is no grid. And Drew, I need to confirm this, but I think that our inverter will potentially support loads uh, with no grid, even with no battery, but I'm not certain of that. So I, I need to confirm and I'll get back to you on that. But it sounds like sunny day um, outlet from SMA yeah. will do that. Yeah, yeah. And and I, that that product has actually been around a long. I think it's called Secure Power Supply or SPS. And I would always get that argument from home. I'm not an argument from homeowners. They would say, well, Dan, there's this, there's this SPS from SMA. And and 
my my old boss at the installer you know he liked that idea but he, and it's a great way to easily add uh, a plug right there i don't think there's a lot of extra pieces and parts necessary for that what an outlet and some conduit but it's really not true backup and it's only during the day which which may be great for certain situations but there are exactly there are systems out there and i'm thinking end phase is starting to kind of leverage this where they're if sun's out you're going to get a certain amount of power but a lot of times especially with those end phase you have to install a whole bunch of extra load control devices that when if and if the homeowner wants to add batteries to that system you got to get out there and it's a lot of reconfiguration so it's out there and it's a system but it's not giving you the power when really i would want it at nighttime to keep my lights on how do we start a generator? I mentioned this earlier, it's automatic generator start. So in certain conditions, the inverter or can send a two wire signal to start to trigger the generator to come on and start up. It will then give it a little bit of time to then accept and proof the, the power coming from the generator and then start using the generator to charge up the batteries to start to supporting loads. When does the two wire signal to start get sent? It's when the state of charge of the battery uh, is low enough that it says, okay, batteries are starting to get low. Let's go ahead and send that signal to start. Some systems will also do a load signal. Like if the loads in the house exceed the capability of the inverter, we can also trigger the generator to start. Some of the generators need normally open. Some of the generators need normally closed. Some considerations is I don't want to see an undersized generator because you could be, the inverter could be trying to draw too much power out of that in, uh, generator. And I don't want to see you way oversize the generator because the, like Nathan mentioned, we're only maybe taking in 40 amps from the generator. Uh, but if the generator is a 26 K generator, uh, it's not really ever going to be uh, uh, able to use all of that power. And perhaps maybe the homeowner already has the 26 K generator. Well, there's other configurations that maybe we could use to leverage some more of that power, or maybe we just accept it for what it is. Number of cold starts. I think I mentioned this kind of earlier, hinted at it a little bit. Uh, you know, you're starting these up and shutting them down. Uh, that can cause a lot of cold starts on a, an engine uh, inside the generator. Uh, we're not really concerned with that because our engines are designed for that. Um, these generators must be 240 volts. Uh, and we need want to be sure we wire the generators into the generator port. The generator has to have two wire start. And I will tell you this. You don't have to use a Briggs and Stratton generator with our inverter. Any two-wire start generator, I, I mean, I'd like you to, right? I'm not going to say not, uh, but it's it's you. any two-wire generator, two-wire signal and start generator can be used. Uh, but it does have to um, you know, have automatic starting and stopping capabilities, uh, be approved for unintended operation. Uh, and keep in mind, if you are working on these generators or servicing them, and it's usually in the manuals, disconnect the starting battery or there's usually some sort of prime mover disconnect because it's possible that if you're working on it you could get a signal to start from a different piece of equipment while you have your hands inside that engine uh, i already mentioned this some use normally open some use normally closed for the two wire signal to start here's a picture of the generator i'm kind of showing you where you're going to land the uh power from the generator going into the inverter you're going to run it into the gen port you can see it here. And then I'm going to mention uh, on the right here is where you see the two wire dry contact port is where you send the signal to start. In our generators, in the, the kind of the larger power protect uh, 20 and 20, uh, 26 or 22, uh, the two wire signal to start is terminals number four and five. You can see them there. And the, the, the 12, it's on uh, four and five, but it's just a little bit different. So just so we understand, you would send power from the generator to the gen input on the inverter, and the two-wire signal to start goes between the inverter and the generator. This is kind of a, a, a schematic, and, and I know we're kind of running up on time, so I'm not going to dive into this too deep, uh, but we have main panel. This is where grid would be. We have backed up loads panel. Here's our generator. Here's our DC coupled solar. Here's our rapid shutdown button, and here's our battery. Some other considerations, and I saw this a lot with people that would want to do portable generators. Uh, They're less expensive. If you are going to leverage a, a portable generator to feed into the gen input port of some of these inverters, it's got to be 240. A lot of these don't have two-wire capability to be started or stopped. So 
you know, give us a call, make sure you tell us what model, what, what you're trying to do there before you integrate some of these things. But it is possible. Keep in mind that a lot of these generators, uh, the, the neutral is either bonded or not bonded to the frame of the generator. Pay very close attention to, to how that works. It's usually in the generator manual uh, and call us to, to talk to us. These are usually 30 or 50 amp inlets that you could put on the outside of the house. A lot of these are, can either be run by propane or gasoline, uh, kind of the tri-fuel or, or dual fuel is what they call them. There is a, a tri-fuel one. I think it's natural gas. Um, I always like to use propane because you never have to put stable or anything in the gas tank. And a lot of people get a portable generator, they buy it, they start it up, and then they leave it sitting there for a year. And then when the power finally goes out a year later, the, the, the gasoline's all gummed up in the carburetor. Uh, you are having to store fuel. Uh, and one thing to keep in mind, unlike the transfer switches, unlike the micro interconnection devices in the inverters, you have to be very careful that you're not backfeeding your generator to the grid, right? Don't plug your generator into the dryer outlet and turn your main breaker off. That's not approved. You know, you have to have interlocking breakers or some code compliant method so that there's never a possibility of you backfeeding your generator. So we're going to run through the system layouts in the next few minutes, and then, then we'll finish up. What are we looking hey, at? Daniel, here? I think yes. these are great. And I just wanted to remind you, we've got somebody who's asking about the Solark 15K that's got that um, 200 amp pass through. Yeah. Um, and so I want you to highlight that when you get there. We do have that as an option available through Briggs and Stratton. Um, and I think that uh, there's another question here. Can portable generator be used for EV charging in the case of an emergency? So if you'll hit those two, that'd be great. Yeah, I, I think people have seen this picture. I, I, maybe you have Nathan, there's like a Tesla with a little, one of those like cargo trailers or a bike trailer with a little portable generator on the back. Um, it's, it's pretty ridiculous that we've come. It's, so it, that's a true hybrid, right? So absolutely you, you could charge up an EV and. And I think that's really crucial is in, a, in an emergency, a lot of people are thinking about transportation. And I start to hear a lot about uh, what about vehicle to grid? And I don't mean to get sidetracked here, everyone. I know we're running out of time. But uh, the last thing I might want to do is discharge my ability to drive to support home loads. Uh, ideally, I'd want it the other way around. I still have home batteries to provide the power, still have solar on the home. Uh, to be able to feed those batteries, be able to drive and charge up that, that EV. So that could be a whole other topic. Uh, but what are we looking at here is a grid feeding into non-backed up loads. Here's that meter main. This is uh, what we have on the West Coast here. We're going to have a breaker down here at the bottom of this load center. And we're going to feed into the grid port of our inverter. We're going to have DC coupled solar. It should be noted that we have an AP smart rapid shutdown transmitter built into our inverter that's imparting a keep alive signal on the power conductors going to the solar modules and we have ap smart um, rapid shutdown modules so if you push that button the solar is going to shut down at the module level we have our critical loads backed up panel we have our batteries down here and we have them going into a combiner box this is a midnight solar combiner that does actually have overcurrent protection. It's got that breaker up in the top right corner. You, a lot of jurisdictions don't necessarily uh, have to make you use this. So it's, it's kind of an optional feature, but I like to show it just to have kind of reference that you want to wire. Daniel, our, our batteries have that built-in breaker as well, right? That's right. Yeah. Thank you, Nathan. We do have built-in breakers in all of our batteries. What does that do? It provides overcurrent protection device, but it also allows you to safely service the batteries or install the batteries. You can turn a battery off, right? You can't turn your, your truck battery off. Uh, they're always live, so you can flip that breaker off. Thank you, Nathan, for pointing that out. Sure. Well, we, have, we have just yeah. a few minutes left. So, I mean, we're showing which generator we're we showing here and, and what um, how could this generator be used? Can it charge batteries? Can it um, supply critical loads? Can yeah. It both. Yeah, thank you, Nathan. It's two wire signal to start. If the batteries start to get low, that generator is going to start up and charge those batteries. It can also help support loads while it's charging the batteries. Here's that Solar 15K. People love the Solar 15K. Why? Because it has a service rated disconnect. It has a 200 amp breaker built into the thing. I got my grid. I got my meter can with the meter socket feeding into a Solar 15K. 
all of that's passing straight through into that whole home backed up load center up top. I have a Tygo transmitter. I got DC coupled solar. I got my batteries and I got a large generator because the, the Solar 15K can accept a lot more power from that generator. So we can, again, start that generator up to support loads and charge batteries. We can do off-grid. Essentially, this is very similar to the system that you saw uh, the first slide. And I've seen this. This can be done and support more loads than you might think. 6K doesn't sound like a lot, but when you actually start to do a load calc and understand that a lot of appliances could be moved over to propane or natural gas, this is a great situation. Uh, here's an example of some interlocking breakers. In this example, the generator, that portable generator, is never going to be able to charge the batteries. But what we can do is use the portable generator to give this energy storage system a break and, and allow the, the portable generator to power loads while the solar is recharging the batteries. Uh, it is potential that you could use the portable to feed into the inverter. Uh, make sure you call us, contact us before you do this, because uh, we want to make sure you're using the right portable for this system. You can string our inverters together. Nathan correctly pointed me out um, that there's, uh, you know, there's a certain number of batteries you can combine in parallel, certain number of inverters uh, where we can make this system into a, a whole home backup and provide that system. Training at simplifypower.com is our email. Please email us if you have any questions about these designs uh, or if you want to talk to an application engineer. Thank you, so everyone. I know that was kind of quick at the end. Uh, any questions, Nathan? So Daniel, that was a good segue. Um, Nathan asks, are there example wiring diagrams available for different possible architecture? So if you have other architectures, I, I, Daniel just showed single line diagrams there. I think I'll answer it if that's okay, Daniel. Our yeah. sales application engineers that Daniel just mentioned are available at 805-640-6700 extension two. And if you're wanting help with a wiring diagram, they can, they can give you that. We're also going to be providing these slides that have the single line diagrams on them as well. Um, Eric says, Eric Lo, uh, Lodell says, Lobdell says, uh, so if your inverter is in a fault mode or it shuts down, it will do a grid pass through. I have not seen this on battery powered inverter before. Um, so Eric, uh, yes, it is true that if the inverter went into a fault, it would shut down uh, pass through to protect the home, et cetera. Um, David says, and Daniel take this please, will Briggs be utilizing their own inverter in place of the Solark eventually? Yes, yes, and we're doing that now. And I hope, you know, the roadmap, uh, our, our inverter is really competing with more of the Solark 8K and maybe the Solark 12K, but I, I'm definitely going to see that there is going to be that uh, competition with Solark 15K, and, and I look forward to the roadmap. All right, Daniel, that's all the questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Nathan, for joining us, and thank you for everyone being here. We'll see you next time.